Welcome everyone to Connecticut Votes for Animals, our breakout session. Our topic for this session is going to be the local control for the sale of puppies, kittens, and bunnies in retail stores. Um, my name is Kathy Wirth and I'm a member of the CBA Advisory Board. Um, today we've got 45 minutes scheduled, so our plan is to have a, our panelist discussion for about 30 minutes, and then we'll try to leave some time for uh, to answer your questions. So if you do have any questions, you can submit them. There's a box at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Um, you can submit those questions. The other attendees can't see them, but the panelists can. Um, but we'll try to save them to the end, but you can go ahead and ask them as you think of them. Um, today, we're very fortunate to have four people on our panel that I know work very hard to protect animal rights. And I'd like to introduce our state representatives, Rehab Ellie Brennan and Jason Doucette. And we also have Annie Hornish from the Humane Society of the US and Deborah Bresch from the ASPCA. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to them. Go ahead, Annie. Okay, great. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thanks for organizing this. Um, and um, I, I guess we'll start off. My first question will be to Representative Ali Brennan. Uh, and first I'd like to thank you and um, Representative Doucette for championing this bill. Uh, we tried last year, obviously got cut short. Um, but thank you for bringing it up again and for all your hard work on this important issue. Um, so representative, if someone asks you, what would this law do? What would you say? Well, first let me start by saying thank you for having me. And um, I'm Rahab Ali Brennan. I'm the state representative for the second district, which includes my hometown of Bethel, part of Danbury, part of Reading, part of Newtown. Um, and I got hooked onto this issue um, by a volunteer um, that worked on my campaign and she also um, brought me to one of the, um, I guess, protests outside of one of the pet shops in Danbury, Sherry Axel. So shout out to Sherry. Um, but yeah, we've been working on this for, it's going to be three years now. Um, but this law, which is a little different than what we did in the past, would basically simplify um, that municipalities have the power to regulate the sale of dogs, cats, and rabbits. Um, local government already has the burden of managing pet overpopulation. Um, local tax dollars are spent housing and euthanizing dogs. You know, pet store regulation may be a key aspect of this management and as such should remain a local decision. Thank you. Uh, well, we are very pleased that the bill has actually gotten bill number now. You know, it's a HB 5974. Uh, um, and I guess this question is for Representative Doucette. Um, before we get to the bill, we should, we really need to elaborate on the problem. The bill is being proposed in order to fight puppy mills. Can you define what a puppy mill is? Thanks, Deb. And thanks everyone for uh, uh, attending and logging in. Great turnout and uh, happy to see everybody here. Um, just real quick to introduce myself, I'm, I'm State Rep Jason Doucette, uh, representing the 13th House District, which is Manchester, which is my hometown and part of the north uh, part of uh, Glastonbury. Um, and yeah, we've been working on this issue, uh, like Representative Ali Brennan, this is uh, my second term. Uh, we connected um, actually before we were sworn in um, back in 2018 on this issue and um, agreed we wanted to uh, introduce um, a bill in the 2019 session. And um, yeah, the, the, the core problem is, is the issue of puppy mills. In fact, um, we alternately call this uh, legislation, this concept, both the pet shop bill and the puppy mill bill. And it's an interesting one um, because when you say, okay, well, the, the, the intent of the legislation is to uh, cut down on the practice, the inhumane practice of puppy mills, people say, well, oh, there, there are puppy mills in Connecticut. Well, in fact, there, um, there are not really many puppy mills that we know of, and, and you folks who are involved in this issue may know of some exceptions to that rule. Um, however, uh, there is a pipeline of commercially bred animals coming from puppy mills uh, in, in other states. And um, I think there's the, uh, many of you may be familiar with the Horrible Hundred and where those originate. Um, I, I, I believe, as I recall, places like Missouri and Pennsylvania tend to be um, some of the, the worst offenders of this, but um, those are where most of the uh, puppy mills are located. And again, puppy mills are defined as some place uh, that uh, animals, dogs are, are bred uh, for um, commercial purposes. Uh, and this is where the, uh, the worst conditions um, can exist in the larger mills that are uh, uh, virtually unregulated 
And I think we're going to get more into that and why that is, um, because that becomes the second question. Okay, so there are, we, we, all, we all have heard of puppy mills. Um, we know of some of the worst abuses taking place, um, but aren't these places regulated? Um, and I think the answer, which again, well, I think we'll get into more, is that certainly, yes, they're supposed to be regulated, um, but uh, the enforcement of those regulations has been so abysmal and especially more so um, over the last, uh, say, four to five years and, and all of the data um, uh, bears that out. So um, this way, it, it, uh, legislation is a way in, in controlling what types of animals um, that can be sold on a retail basis in Connecticut. This is the way that we in Connecticut can do our part to help control the issue of uh, puppy mills and commercially bred animals and abuses uh, and inhumane practices that result from some of the worst offenders. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, 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 is, uh, that is how we get to the, the puppy mill aspect of this uh, legislation. And, and it I'm, might be worth, it, Annie, I, yeah, I know you're going to jump in. I just might be worth adding simply that they're both poorly regulated and the laws themselves are extremely weak. Um, but we will, uh, so lots, a lot of stuff is uh, permissible that, uh, uh, that really can't even be, can't be regulated. Uh, but Annie, uh, let me pass it on to you. Yeah, yes, I, just to add on to that too, um, a, a question often arises, how do we know Connecticut pet shops are actually sourcing from puppy mills? Um, and the answer, because you know, it's out of state largely, and the answer is because we have a paper trail. Uh, that paper trail is due to a Connecticut law that passed in 2009 and, and was enhanced in 2014. Uh, so uh, what we did at the, uh, my organization, the Humane Society of the United States, we um, submitted a public records request to the Connecticut Department of Agri Agriculture. And uh, they provided us with the certificates of origin uh, for puppies sold by pet stores in the state of Connecticut from uh, November 2018 to March of 2019. These uh, certificates of origin verified that Connecticut pet stores have sourced puppies from breeders and brokers with, with uh, abysmal animal welfare records. Also, in addition, uh, just this past November, in an HSUS undercover investigation of puppy mills, we found again that uh, Connecticut pet shops are trafficking dogs from puppy mills. And that brings us to the necessity for this bill. Thank you. Representative Doucette, can you do you know how many pet shops are actually selling puppies in uh, Connecticut now? Yeah, it's um, a perhaps surprisingly small number, um, which um, I, you know is a good thing in, in a way, but uh, also um, you know points to the fact that in in regulating this activity, we're not we're not reaching that far um, in, in that we're not, uh, uh, you know, disrupting um, what, what is a robust market in the state of Connecticut um, that some of the opponents of this uh, uh, bill might, uh, might allege. Um, I believe the number is somewhere between 12 and 14 shops right now in the state of Connecticut um, that, that currently sell um, uh, uh, dogs, cats, rabbits that, that are likely to be sourced um, from some of uh, these uh, puppy mills. Um, and uh, some of them are, are, are well known. Some of them do not have a, a good track record. Um, I um, represent Manchester, part of Manchester, um, which has uh, the uh, infamous outfit known as the dog house, um, which until recently had actually even been leasing animals, um, but was happy to cast a vote uh, and, and push through legislation in 2019 that now uh, prohibits that practice. Um, but uh, but they're, they're, they're still open um, and they're still um, selling dogs sourced uh, presumably from, from puppy mills, it seems. Also operating a, a uh, quote unquote rescue operation, um, which also, uh, you know, seems to source dogs also from, from, from puppy mills. Um, but more alarmingly, um, I also represent the town of Glastonbury and right in uh, my district in Glastonbury, there is a proposal for uh, a shop known as the Puppy Palace to open. Um, 
Uh, luckily, um, I, it has not opened yet. And um, to my knowledge, I haven't been down there in a little while, but it, it, there's a sign on the building, but they're, they're, they're not quite set up uh, to go. We, we uh, investigated that a bit uh, some months ago with the Department of Agriculture to ask questions about what types of licenses they had, because it, it seemed that they were already starting uh, marketing as if they were licensed by the state of Connecticut, when in fact they weren't. Uh, so that was very concerning. But but uh, most concerning of all with regard to that particular outfit is that they uh, are, are looking to open to franchise um, that, uh, that that shop and um, and open multiple locations across the state of Connecticut. So while we're sitting here with with 12 to 14 shops, um, it's it's certainly not outside the realm of possibility that uh, a year from now we could be looking at 20 shops in the state of Connecticut. So that's why it's, it's very important to, to act now on this. And that, that's why it is um, also important uh, to, to give local control on this issue. And, you know, I, in full disclosure, I myself went back and forth. We've had some, some discussions, um, the legislators and the, and the advocates working on this about whether or not um, it's, it's best to, to, to push for a statewide ban, which was the legislation 2019 or whether it's better to go uh, for local control is what we're doing in 2020 and, and again now in 2021. But um, when you look at the Puppy Palace in particular, I, I think it, it, it makes a strong argument for local control. Um, and, and we've seen that in, in Glastonbury, frankly, uh, I've heard from many constituents and, and many of the elected members of the town council who were alarmed to know that the Puppy Palace was uh, potentially opening in their town and uh, that, that they very well may be powerless uh, to do anything uh, to stop it outside of the normal uh, sort of zoning approvals, um, which um, are discretionary, but in most cases are hard to deny. Um, so um, so that, that, that's, that's a, a real world reason why um, the local control issue is, is an important one this year um, on, this, on this subject. And if I could add, I mean, some of the largest and most successful chains like PetSmart and Petco, you know, and a lot of the thriving mom and pop shops we have in our towns do not sell dogs. And so I think when people say we're going to be shutting down the shops because they, you know, a pet shop has to sell animals, it's not true. Um, I know that that's, that's been an argument we've, we've faced. Thank you. That's a huge issue. And I think what dovetails neatly with that is the fact that this bill also won't impact responsible breeders. I mean, we find sometimes when these bills are introduced that organizations that oppose them leverage the breeders uh, uh, against the bills. And that shouldn't be the case. Um, responsible breeders never sell to pet shops, only to directly to consumers. A review of codes of ethics for the National Breed Clubs representing dog breeds recognized by the American Kennel Club found that nearly all national breed clubs include ethics statements that breeders should not even sell to pet stores. Respons responsible breeders sell directly to the public so they can screen prospective buyers in person. They wouldn't just hand a puppy over to, uh, you know, to someone, uh, to, be, to a truck driver to be transported far away to a pet store, displayed like a product and sold to anyone with a credit card. So you know, this will not impact consumer choice. Uh, folks can go to, can adopt, they can go to responsible breeders. This is, this is to get directly at the issue of puppy milk cruelty that we have not been able to address in other, um, in other ways. Um, and we've tried them. Which <laughs> On that line, Deb, what would you say to people who ask, aren't there federal regulations uh, that prevent these mass production breeders? Well, as, the, as Representative Doucette was, was discussing earlier, um, you know, puppy milk trafficking thrives in Connecticut because the federal standards are so weak and there's such poor enforcement at both the federal and state level. Um, even though the public uh, USDA uh, database has re was recently reinstated, I know folks have, are familiar with that, um, but it contained information on, on breeders and the violations they were have received and brokers as well. Um, uh, that information has now been restored. USDA enforcement um, of commercial dog breeding facilities has plummeted. Uh, so um, these, the, the Connecticut law that depends 
on that on that federal regulation, the Connecticut sourcing law, which says that certain breeders and brokers can't sell. Um, can't offer their animals in Connecticut pet stores um, if they have a certain number of violations. The USDA enforcement is so weak. Uh, you know, they give, they just start, they, they treat everything as a, as a teach, teachable moment with uh, these breeders um, that the law is really irrelevant. The state law is really irrelevant. Um, many conditions that are considered legal, but would be unacceptable by most connected voters are also permitted under federal law. So you can find you'll have cramped cages, wire flooring, and complete lack of socialization. Um, a USDA licensed breeder can legally confine dogs in stacked wire cages only six inches larger than themselves for either the, for the, the animal than, than themselves for either entire for their entire lives, denying them exercise, socialization, and basic veterinary care. They can have hundreds or thousands of dogs and breed them at every heat cycle. Breeders who violate these abysmal standards usually get just a slap on the wrist due to the poor enforcement. Um, and you know, so enforcement is appalling. And the USDA makes statements um, indicating that it sees its role as more of a protector of this industry than a regulator of it. Mm -hmm. we, we really need to address this, this problem in a different way, which is through you know, banning the sale, the retail sale of, of animals. And we're attempting to give localities control over this issue mm -hmm. with this bill. Thank, thank you, Deb. Yeah, and that, that's a great point though. The regulations have failed, frankly, and um, at both the federal level and even at the state level too. Um, Representative Ali Brennan, would you care to comment on whether uh, other states are doing what they're doing? Are they taking action as well on this issue? Yeah, well, um, nationwide, um, over 340 localities have passed uh, humane sourcing laws. Um, also states like California, Maryland, and Maine have enacted statewide bans on the sale of dogs, cats, and rabbits in pet stores. Um, and we know that New York, Illinois, and New Jersey are working to enact statewide bans. And, you know, that kind of freaks me out as a, you know, I represent Danbury, which is on the border of New York. Um, we already have two of these pet shops in Danbury, one closed. Um, but what does that mean for us if they, you know, they get banned in New York, do they hop over the border and come to Connecticut and do we see more pop up? So, um, you know, this effort is timely. Annie, outside of animal cruelty, are there other reasons why people are fighting puppy mills? Uh, yes, um, it's also a consumer uh, protection issue. Um, puppy selling pet stores often lie about where their puppies come from. They sell sick puppies to consumers. Uh, they've, uh, as alluded to earlier by Representative Doucette, they utilize predatory lending schemes uh, to sell overpriced puppies. Uh, what these consumers get are, you know, often they have to deal with high veterinary costs or behavioral issues of these dogs that were taken you, oftentimes too early from their, their mothers. And, you know, and it's, it's there's the, also the obvious, the heartbreak uh, that the family experiences if the dog is sick, is sick or dies from this. Um, pet stores who source from puppy mills have sold puppies that make people sick as well. There's been uh, disease outbreaks uh, linked to pet store puppies, um, such as recently an antibiotic resistant Campylobacter outbreak that sickened over a hundred uh, people. This was in the United States. At least one person was from Connecticut. And that's according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And Annie, I'm, I would like to just pop in. Um, I think it's important for the advocates to know, I think well, from my point of view that this is like the best way to make our argument is that it's kind of a consumer protection bill. Obviously we're all here because we love animals um, and obviously the activists do, but um, I think we were talking to legislators who may not understand or why are we talking about animals? Um, you turn it around and make it about the consumer. People are paying money. Um, they don't know that they're getting these dogs sourced from these horrible places because the laws are not um, doing their job. And so we have to intervene it and we have to make sure that we're protecting the consumers and the animals. Yeah, and I think it's worth adding. I think this is something that we don't think of that often. Best Friends Animal Society has, some, has done some good work in this area. Um, and they've actually published some studies which show that uh, these dogs, um, uh, these puppies, uh, can also suffer from a higher rate of behavioral problems than other, um, um, than other dogs. And you know, so when we're talking about bringing those dogs into the community, that can be a real issue. And I actually just heard of a terrible case that has not resolved well. Puppy was sold by All Pets Club over the summer. Um, and the dog, the 
owner, the person who, the purchaser, who actually, <laughs> this sort of is a perfect storm. She's still paying off the puppy through one of these predatory lending schemes. Um, she, the dog basically has drawn blood every single day from, the, from a family member. The dog is not well um, psychologically. And it's been a heartbreaking situation. She purchased the dog right after another, a beloved dog passed away. So, um, you know, we're bringing those kinds of puppies in the, into the community when we could be placing rescued animals or responsible breeders who are breeding healthy dogs could, could sell their dogs to, uh, to Connecticut residents. So that's also, also something, is to consider, that's something else to consider. Um, Representative Doucette, what has been the progress um, on fighting puppy mills in the Connecticut legislature thus far? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, um, Representative Allie Brennan and I um, introduced a bill for a statewide ban modeled off the uh, Maryland, uh, particularly the Maryland example, um, back in 2019. Um, that bill was, was, was uh, fairly well received by our colleagues, uh, frankly, and um, it um, was passed out of the Environment Committee with some opposition um, from um, Republican members mostly, uh, those who uh, I think um, Representative Bohr may have um, mentioned in her conversation with, with Joanne are, are the ones who are also advocating uh, for uh, expanded hunting um, and are generally the folks who are not uh, friends of, of animal uh, welfare issues. Um, but besides that, we had pretty broad support. Uh, so it passed out of the Environment Committee. Uh, there was a campaign that some of you may have even been involved in to reach out to uh, individual legislators in the House and Senate um, and uh, to ask them to co-sponsor that legislation. And we amassed a, a, a good deal of co-sponsors, uh, Republican and Democrat, folks from all over the state. Um, and I, I think there was generally broad support for the concept. Um, Two things happened in 2019. We essentially ran out of time, which, which happens with lots of good legislation, unfortunately, um, because of the nature of, of the way we do business in, in Connecticut and our, uh, we're constitutionally time constrained on when we can be in session. The other thing is too, we ran into some roadblocks, I think at the highest levels of, of leadership. There were some um, well-placed uh, 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 you know, opponents of this bill or folks who had uh, questions or concerns with it. Um, most notably, I say the House Minority Leader, uh, Vincent Candelora, um, we have been told is not uh, is not a fan of this. I've had some brief discussions with him on it, but certainly um, I think as it proceeds further, it, it, we continue to work on this issue. That is someone who I think we need to have some longer form discussions with um, because as the House Minority Leader, he, he has a, a significant um, uh, role to play in, in, in setting the agenda um, uh, for bills that, that we act on. Um, so that was 2019. 2020, um, what happened um, in, in between our two legislative sessions, uh, I, I think as some of you may know, is that the city of Stanford, a few others, but really the city of Stanford, I think uh, seemed to make the most progress on this, on taking local action, on attempting to take local action uh, to ban the retail sale of, of, of um, commercially bred animals in pet shops. Um, they did not get across the finish line in doing that. There were some legal questions, some concerns asked um, uh, by the, the members of the, the Stanford um, uh, legislative body there, um, which uh, I think uh, necessitated uh, us as the legislator a, a legislature acting to uh, make it affirmative in state statute that um, this is the type of activity that a city council or a city legislative a body would be empowered uh, to act on. So we came back with the bill in 2020 to allow for local control. Um, and of course, um, our session was effectively shut down or abbreviated by COVID-19. Um, so we made some progress on, on that, uh, but we're back again, of course, in 2021 um, with the same bill, which is uh, in the Planning and Development Committee um, in the legislature. And um, I, I, think, uh, I think we have uh, certainly, um, uh, you know, cause for optimism. Um, and we have um, people, like I said, who in the past have supported us on these issues. Um, but uh, I think of still a full-scale lobbying effort 
all over the state uh, has to be made on this issue. And just like in 2019, where we, I think we had some great success, um, folks should be contacting their uh, individual legislators to request that they co-sponsor this legislation and support it. Certainly if um, you come from a place where your legislator, uh, state rep or state senator sits on the planning and development committee, that's the, the first stop for this legislation. Um, so those are folks that we want to have on board with the effort um, sooner rather than later. So um, I, uh, I, I suppose we may talk more about that. But again, um, you know, keep your eyes open. I think uh, Connecticut Votes for Animals, ASPCA, Humane Society of uh, the U.S. did an excellent job on this last time. So keep your eyes open for uh, those calls to action on this uh, as uh, our session moves forward. I just I just wanted to add as somebody I've been around um, uh, Hartford uh, or lobbying there since uh, the early aughts, um, you know, I think the thinking at the ASPCA has been that we're going to, we have to try the regulatory approach first, you know, so we got the law passed to have certificates of origin sent to Department of Agriculture so we could trace exactly which animals are coming into Connecticut. You know, and then we did the task force uh, that um, Annie and I uh, sat on and in you know, 2014 um, um, uh, restricted which breeders and brokers can, can offer their, uh, their wares in Connecticut pet stores. Um, and because as we've discussed, because of federal problems, because of state enforcement, um, that law is really, that state law is really meaningless, which is why we've arrived at this juncture where we feel that we need to discuss bans and banning the sale of, uh, of uh, the retail sale of, of dogs and from puppy mills. Um, and so Representative Ali Brennan, given that we're talking about, we, we see the importance of, of bans, why are we attacking the problem, this problem of, of puppy mill sales in Connecticut in this somewhat circuitous manner of, of uh, you know, um, authorizing localities to restrict pet, pet stores? Yeah, well, and I mean, trust me, we, I think what that's been mentioned, we've all debated this, is this the right course of action? But I think some of the activists have to be aware that we've been trying to do this for how many years, you know? Um, I think we have to look at it in a different lens. Unfortunately, like Jason mentioned, um, there are people in leadership roles that are just complete roadblocks that you can't move around. Um, and I would like to note that the 2019 law was watered down in the Environment Committee. It was watered down into a study. And so Jason and I introduced an amendment to put it back to the bill that we wanted originally. So those are some of the things that we had to circumvent. And it all, it all is about education because legislators we're very iffy about it. Like, you know, are you, you're closing businesses? Like this isn't a good bill. Democrats are shutting down more businesses. And when we educated them and took the time, they, they understood what was going on and then they were more on board. So it is a campaign about um, making people more aware. But um, to that end, I think, um, you know, we have municipalities that are ready to take action to fight the puppy mills. And um, we need to make it crystal clear that they can enact such bans without fear of incurring legal fees due to challenges. Um, and basically our hope is that we can build a critical mass of towns that pass such ordinances so that the legislature will take action. Because I think this will give legislators maybe the courage to, okay, you know, most of the state, most of the towns in Connecticut agree with this. Maybe now we can do this. And something similar happened with the, um, what was it? It was a toxic waste um, ban. So I know people probably know, like they, I think pass them in almost every town and then the legislature finally said, okay, now we'll, we'll, now we'll ban it um, statewide. So I think it's just like, we want to build more awareness and go town to town by educating people more and, and seeing where that can take us. Um, and like I said, we, we battled with this back and forth, um, but I think we're just trying to try something different. It, it hasn't worked just going for the full ban. And so here we are. All <laughs> right. Thank you. Annie, do you want to speak to your thoughts on, on this bill's significance as well? Sure. Thank, thanks, Deb. Um, yeah, and also just to add on to the prior history, uh, I would like to give a shout out to uh, the uh, Senator Bob Duff, uh, the Senate Majority Leader, uh, and the former State Representative Brenda Kupchik, who were instrumental in passing the 2014 bill. And that was uh, a heavy lift. It was a big fight at the time, as was the 2009 battle to get the certificates of origin. And also, um, I want to comment that the enforcement of the law it, it, with the Department of Agriculture, it's complaint driven. So that right out of the gate limits the ability, you know, it's not like a proactive way of um, enforcing the law. Um, and when the complaints happen, it's rare that those get followed up on fully. So that's an, another issue with, um, that we see here in Connecticut. 
but we believe that municipal the municipalities already have the power to enact local ordinances uh, to ban the sale. However, uh, what happened in Stanford, I want to get into that just for a minute, uh, there was uncertainty created um, by the Connecticut Department of Agriculture regarding the issue of local control. That was in November of 2019. What happened was that the city of Stanford was poised to pass an ordinance to ban it. Uh, uh, DOAG intervened by suggesting that their authority over the regulation of pet shops may preempt local control. And what happened, excuse me, is that um, rather than risking legal action, uh, Stanford decided to issue a resolution. Since that time, we've got several resolutions calling for action. The cities of Stanford, Norwalk, and Manchester have enacted local resolutions. And what they, those resolutions say is, is they're calling upon the Connecticut General Assembly to either enact a statewide ban or to clarify that municipalities have a local control. Um, other ju jurisdictions are actively considering similar resolutions. So that's happening. We're building momentum in that way, but there is a desire for this to happen. And, and notably, the first three resolutions we've passed were in communities that have pet shops that sell. So this is a very popular, uh, with the people, it's a very popular issue. So again, it was said earlier, but making it crystal clear that the, the purpose of this law is to make it crystal clear uh, for municipalities so they don't have to worry about a lawsuit which wastes taxpayer dollars. So um, uh, one final question, um, and I'll give this again to Representative Ali Brennan. Uh, what can uh, animal advocates, Connecticut Votes for Animal supporters and you know all animal advocates, what can they do to help you? Well, contact your state rep and state senator and ask them to, to co-sponsor our bill. That's the, the best way and you know, um, educating them if they have questions about it and just pushing back on maybe some of the nonsense that we were able to um, give you more information on today. Thank you. Thank you. Great guys, I'm gonna jump in. We got a lot of great questions. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and see, if, uh, I apologize in advance if somebody asks a question and I don't get to it. Um, some are a little redundant, they're all good. But um, anyway, somebody did ask, can we please include ferrets in the bill? <laughs> Does anybody want to answer about ferrets? Well, the plan is to include rabbits, cats, dogs, and rabbits. We are, we are including Eventually. rabbits. Yeah, it's, it, I guess the bill is for bunnies, kittens, yep. and puppies. So I guess somebody would like well, to support the ferrets. Every yeah. every addition is going to make complicate the matter. Every addition is going to decrease the chance of passage. At this point, I think that's a battle for another day. Um, okay. And we have a question, and I know this is. But from also, also, wait, can I just jump in? Also, right now, what we're talking about is local control to regulate pet stores. So these are the kinds of issues. This is going to come up as these local ordinances are are discussed, and as the ultimately statewide ban might be discussed. That will come up later. Okay. So another question we have is: local control is great for places that have sympathetic local governments. What about those of us who have long-standing local governments that only care about the local business and don't care about anything except having another business in their town? Well, and I think that's the whole point is that we can bring the fight to the town. I think we've just been kind of like screaming and, you know, about a statewide ban, but when you localize it and people get activated and you go to these town hall meetings and you put the pressure on your first selectman or your mayor, um, they feel that. Um, we know. You guys um, are great activists. You're always writing letters, um, protesting, standing outside. I think you have to apply that pressure on the local side. And I think, like I said too, with if a New York ban happens, um, we want the local ordinances so that, like you know, making sure that even though Bethel doesn't have a pet shop that sells, um, we can make sure we can get ahead of it and make sure that we can make sure that doesn't happen. So those are kind of the things that we have to do. But yeah, it's not going to be easy. Um, it hasn't been easy on the state level, but I think we can gain more ground on the town by town basis. And, and I know that Sherry, that question, that's what we're here for. We all want to just unite around a town. And if we know there's someone's going to introduce it or ask their first selectman, um, we'll be there to help push. Right with them. And run for office, run yeah. for office. <laughs> this is a municipal election year. We need, we need more animal welfare activists. Uh, and, and frankly, I think this is a very popular issue I've seen. And 
uh, somewhat surprised, but I, I guess not really that, um, you know, that animal welfare is, is, is a popular issue on both sides of the aisle and, and people who mm-hmm. aren't necessarily politically involved or engaged on, on, on other issues with their, with their town council are, are, uh, will come out and, and support this. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, let's, 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 you know, spread a, a, a broad, uh, you know, a, a broad spectrum, uh, you know, in terms of our advocacy and, and activism from the local uh, uh, up to the state and, of course, federal level, too. Ideally, there could be a domino effect. I mean, I'll just note that New Jersey has over 120 local bands at this point. Mm-hmm. And I believe New York has quite a few at the local level as well. I think they've been doing well, because of some issues with the state law, how it's structured, that's mm-hmm. been more problematic. So it doesn't have as many. Um, but New Jersey has been very clear um, because of its state law um, that localities can pass these bans, um, you know, which is why we want this language in Connecticut as well. And as a result, over 120 have passed. Okay, great. And, and people would be surprised at how very few people contact their local officials for issues. So when you do, you're heard. And if you can get a small group of your neighbors together, they want to hear from you, they want to serve, and you you can be surprisingly effective. And I just want to show this is one of my favorite pins. Um, I care about animals and I vote. This is all about elections ultimately. So um, let, you know, it's either, you know, elected officials have to know there's consequences for um, complying with a request, right? So letting them know, getting a base behind them to give them the support they need to support these bills is very important to do because they have to make sure they're not going to lose their seats if they take a position. So you have to get people behind them and vote in the good, the people who share your values. I also have to say, I have to put a plug in for um, organizing kids in your towns. I will say I, um, in my town, I, I, I'm based in New Jersey um, and I, uh, as the, my daughter's troop leader, um, Girl Scouts troop leader, uh, I, I used them um, and they submitted um, a whole bunch of letters and uh, spoke to the council people and the council people were all over that. They were very eager <laughs> to talk to the kids. And um, so it's something to, and, and we passed a ban in our town. Okay, I have another question. Actually, um, we have a couple of forms of the same question. Does the bill contain language about having pet shops only adopt out rescue dogs? Uh, no, uh, th- this, this is simply a local control, empowering municipalities to restrict pet shops in a manner um, I forgot how it's phrased, more restrictive than state law. I think that's how it's worded. So that would be done at, that could be decided at the local level because we know that some of the states where they've had bans, they allowed rescue dogs, but then some of the breeders tried to circumvent those, and, those and, laws and, well, and set themselves up as pretend breeders. Well, so, pet, or pet pretend smart, rescue. Yep, Pet Smart and Pet Co. Those are the industry leaders. You'll see rescue dogs in there, but it's the differences between partnering with rescues. That's, a, that's the notable difference. Right. And forming a sham rescue. That's what can happen. It happened in California. And I think, and they have been um, pressing on that. They've, they've yep. people have been brought yes. to justice on that. And the hope, it, the hope is that, you know, when this is passed afterwards, someone would say, I live in Reading and um, Annie, Deborah, or Joanne, um, can you help me introduce, you know, here's, a, here's a, the, the law that we want passed or the ordinance, here's the language prepared by us. Um, and you would give it to your first selectman or board or mayor, and this is what we want passed. And so that's, it's not like we're gonna leave it only up to them to figure out what, how to manage the pet shops. Um, we would have specific language and someone would just raise their hand and say, I wanna do this in Reading, I wanna do this in Manchester. And that's how we would um, attack it. I'll just add that the 2019 bill did specifically include language um, making it clear that um, animal rescue, well, animal welfare organizations could could partner um, in, with pet shops um, to adopt out animals. Um, but you know, some interesting discussions there um, sort of transpired. When we talk about rescues, and we've heard already some mention of, of uh, what we're calling sham rescues, uh, particularly in California after they passed their law. And again, some of the opponents of this um, legislation or this this concept would point to the fact that well, we have a, we still have a lot of animals being trafficked in in the name of rescues to the state of Connecticut, 
Um, so shouldn't we be, you know, talking about, you know, what are, uh, how we're regulating rescues? Um, so that, that may be sort of an ancillary conversation that, that, that happens as we start, uh, going down this road. So, you know, we, we need to be prepared to also have those, uh, conversations, uh, as to, as to what, as to how we're, we're, we're regulating rescues. Cause that, that will, that will come. Um, you know, if, if we, if we're successful, um, I think in, in, in moving some of this legislation. Yeah, there's certainly a need for that. There are some problems with certain rescues uh, bringing dogs in. We have passed laws uh, uh, regulating importation and requiring uh, licenses of those entities. So there, that is a separate issue. Um, and if it, when these issues come up, I think a lot of the spirit of it is not it's disingenuous. They're trying to right. kill <laughs> So right. um, we'll, we'll address that uh, on, another, on another bill at another time. Um, this is another question. Um, can we find out which elected representatives are actually against these bills? Um, <laughs> the writer wrote, and I will not name them, but you can guess who it is. If I know who they are, I will work my off to get their opponents elected. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, I think we mentioned that, you know, the biggest um, roadblock is the uh, minority leader who, you know, who's promoted after Themis Claritus um, retired. So now he's in the top spot on the minority party side. So um, Vince Candelora is someone that we have to keep the pressure on. And, you know, I look forward to working with Jason to have conversations with him, just be frank about where does he stand? What is his concern? Um, and how can we get this over the finish line? So what, one of the questions I have is, I know the last time, we, a couple of years ago, we tried the statewide ban. Um, there were active lobbyists for the, the pet stores. Do you anticipate um, that kind of lobbying with this bill, with the local ordinances that will have the same? Yep. Okay. Yeah. And then what can we do to- And I guess that? the big thing too, well, I think it's interesting too that we're, moving, we're removing it from the environment committee because that's where a lot of those, you know, anti-animal um, opponents are on that committee. Um, so we're moving it to a different committee, planning and development. And, you know, it's a whole different group of people. And um, we know that the, the chair is very sympathetic to the issue and um, to animal welfare issues. So um, it's just gonna be a whole different ballgame. So do you feel optimistic about this bill, Jason and Rahab? Yeah, I think the way we frame it too, but um, like I said, we just we just introduced it. I think we all finally got on the same page, and um, now we're we, we're going to need the public's help to to testify. When there's a public hearing, we need everyone. Um, it's easier this year because you can Zoom testify. So I know it's hard for people to drive to the Capitol and take a day off to go um, testify. So hopefully this time we can have more of our people because um, they the the pet shops do. Um, send like their staff. They send people up there, and it looks yeah. like it's slanted in in them versus us. And so I think we can have a bigger showing this year. Yeah, I'll, I'll reiterate that point too. I mean, everyone should certainly come out. It, it, does, it does mean a lot um, to us as legislators to hear from people within our districts. Um, you know, um, so, so it's important to lobby your individual legislator. And, and uh, again, please show up for the hearing. Um, it does make a difference uh, because, yeah, what, what we saw in 2019, especially, was uh, the pet shops uh, literally had all of their employees, many of whom were teenagers, uh, come up, and they they seem not to know exactly where they were, or what they were doing, um, but uh, they were there. They were there to to testify. So, uh, you know that 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 certainly makes a difference with the virtual hearings this year. Um, it's, it's easier and it's harder to testify. It's easier because certainly you can do it from your home, but it's, it's going to be harder because you may have to wait a little longer, um, for your turn and uh, be tuned into a really long, uh, hearing, but, uh, it, it's, it's so important, but, but, but send those emails and, uh, and please submit, uh, elect, uh, testimony electronically, even if you can't physically, um, show up uh, to testify on the day of the hearing. Great. And also I wanted to just, I wanted to add that, um, you know, as Representative Ali Brennan noted, you know, the purpose of this bill is to bring the fight to the towns. And I think, so I think it's really useful to remember this bill doesn't actually, as much as we might want it to, doesn't actually ban the retail sale. I think that makes it harder for legislators to oppose. Um, and, um, and in addition, uh, you know, the fact that there are, there are 10 pet stores 
14 storefronts. Um, I, you know, there are far more towns that don't have pet stores, um, which means more legislators who don't have pet stores in their districts. That's also useful, I think, to, to recall. And then one thing I wanted to just note on that rescue versus uh, pet store regulation issue, uh, because this will come up um, and pet stores will say they're highly regulated. This goes to the issue of, you know, where the source of this problem. They're, you know, as nice, however, those, those puppies are kept in those stores. And we've heard things, of course, about, uh, about you know, some cruelty um, or inhumane treatment of those, of those puppies. The real source of the problem is back in the Midwest. And the only way we can get at this issue is how we're going about this, this now. So we're going to hear a lot about how pit stores are highly regulated. Um, but we can't let that derail us from, the, from the, what we're really trying to do here which is to prevent the sale of puppy male dogs in, in Connecticut. And we just have to keep that, remember that <laughs> as we move forward. Yeah, One taking... additional thing I'm, uh, oh. I wanted to mention was um, it, b because of um, the way that we're conducting session this year and because of COVID-19, um, that, that does create an impediment for a piece of legislation like this, which is not directly related to the pandemic. Um, that doesn't mean it's going to be impossible because certainly you're going to see lots of legislation that's not directly related to the pandemic, but it does make it more difficult in terms of uh, the amount of time that the committee and that the legislature in general is spending on these issues. So um, what I would say to that is kind of as, as, as Deb just alluded to, um, this is an issue of local control. It's discretionary for the towns. So we're not really weighing into the somewhat meatier issue of whether or not we want to ban it statewide, uh, what the state regulations say and, and so forth. It's a discretionary uh, measure to provide lo that local control. So that, that makes it somewhat of a lighter lift uh, in, a, in a, this year, especially. Yeah, you're taking a lot of the the politics out of it, you know, who are we to say that a town, if a town wants to do this, they should be allowed to, especially if we're not going to act on it. And so I think you probably wouldn't have legislators who in the past would have been opposed are kind of like, okay, here I can appease some people without really doing much, you know? Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I think it's, it, it makes it less controversial. And so it could be hopefully something that's just like, uh, we need a, a bill to um, save us some time while our leadership negotiates another bill and hopefully it's smooth sailing, but like Jason said, you know, there's always going to be bumps and, you know, unexpected uh, things happening. Great. I really appreciate you guys coming. Um, unfortunately, our time is up. This um, session, along with the other sessions that happened um, at the same time, are videotaped and they will be on the CVA website and there'll be some other supporting materials. So you can always go to the CVA website. Um, to see the other videos and this video and any supporting materials and we'll be updating people about when the hearings are and what we can do. So I wanna thank everyone for coming and speaking up for animals. 